so. Doing some technical tweaking over here. But Tommy <laughs> and I will come on down. And uh, Patrick is going to be talking about something naked. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of these is the scientific extreme laser ray? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you propose a title. <laughs> All right. Well, actually, it's uh, astrophotography with the naked camera. That is, for those of you who don't have can uh, telescopes as such, but you've seen all these awe-inspiring photographs, you know, 12 hours total exposure with a yeah. such and such type of telescope, and you sort of give up in despair at the thought of ever being able to do an astral photograph. Not so. Not so. Okay. Well, the answer is, of course, no. Now, many people these days have, and I'm afraid this is an acronym, DSLR cameras. That stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex, which is just, you know, any of these cameras where you, you can see the picture immediately on the back. Now, the one I have is a Canon Rebel uh, T5. It's the one with the plastic case. You can get the T5i which is the one with the heavy metal case, which is much more impressive. But of course, if it's on a tripod or something, it sort of puts more strain on things. It's also self-cleaning, which I suppose is handy, although I have seen my cat cleaning herself. And I really do not want to know what goes on in that camera. But that <laughs> See, the thing about these DSLR cameras is you can change the sensitivity, the ISO rating, way up to like, you know, 6200 or something. So it makes it quite possible to get nice shots like this, just can't tell. Plus, of course, the lens usually, you, know, you sort of twiddle it and it gives you a closer view of the sky with greater magnification. And people with an ordinary camera zooming in, you get Venus, Mars, and that lovely old moon, you know, new, old moon in the new moon arms effect. This is just, uh, here's the light coming from the sun, bouncing to the Earth. It bounces off the Earth, off the moon, and then comes back to the Earth. That takes about three seconds. So this is really three seconds older than this. And another great thing about DSLR cameras, you can take a quick shot, you know, try it with one five hundredth of a second or something, and then just pick, ooh, too dark, make it one two fiftieth of a second, pick, ah, oh, great. Now I can seriously, you know, focus and things like that. In the old days, you had to send the slide film in to Kodak, and about a month or two later, it would come back and your slides would all be ruined because you were under or over them. And I've, I've, I've always found that if you get a nice crescent moon and a planet or two and something in the landscape, you get nice pictures. You can frame them and send them to your relatives. <laughs> yeah, I guess we can't reduce the light that's bouncing off the screen or so. So, yes. Somewhere here, oops, sorry. Wrong button again. Oh no, it's, it's doing the wrong thing. Somewhere around here, I think, is Venus. And on my. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see, but I see it. Yeah. Can you guys see it? No. Because no, looking up close at it, it sort of vanishes because of the pixels. It's there. When I look at it in my. Uh, Oh, there we go. I see it now. You see it? Yeah. I'll just stand back so you all get a better view. Where is it? 
I mean, you can still get good pictures, even though occasionally you hard to look at this one. You know, going backwards here. Okay, this was a, a few years back. You've got crescent moon, Venus, and over here, Jupiter. Plus, Toronto's skyline is sort of reflecting in the water, that's always a nice thing if you can find the right spot to do it. And you notice, so far, this is all just you and your camera, nothing else. I like slides that are, you know, they, they were always exactly right. Absolutely. It's a bottom moon, isn't it? Now, you don't need the moon. You can take pictures of planets only. Jupiter, Mercury, Venus. This was a three-day event where they constantly shifted the side shape of the triangle. And it was historically significant. It's not the best picture in the world. But on the other hand, you know, you can show it to people and say that sometimes you get three planets all together. Oh, there's Venus. Yeah, Venus is the right one at the bottom. Mercury is just to the right of the sign. Jupiter is to the right. This was at the... Uh, What's the one where they all dress up like ponies? <laughs> Anime North. Anime North Science Fiction and Fantasy Convention. As I recounted once before, this is at the end of a dark alley looking out over the parking lot. And I had told this group of young people that if they followed me into the dark alley, I would show them something really beautiful. Security misinterpreted. So after much explanation and you know showing actual objects, uh, was not charged. You have to be careful. That's Mercury, see? How many people in this room have actually been able to see Mercury? Come on, that's up. How many have? All right. Some of the most famous, some of the famous British astronomers, because first of all, they're way up in the northern latitude, and well, we know what the weather is like. They went through their entire careers without ever actually seeing Mercury. So if you can take a picture of it, you, you know, when you at an astronomy convention or something, you can pull it out and show, prove, in fact, you have seen your thing. It's always pretty close to the sun. It's uh, framed by the clouds, too. Hey, pardon? Nice to see it framed by the clouds, too. Yes, yeah, so well, there's like five or six shots. These clouds were whizzing by fairly quickly. About half the shots, Mercury isn't visible. You just got the cloud. Venus was a bit higher up, so of course it was always there. I was really glad that I got Mercury that early, early morning. Assuming you will all be using the color setting on your camera rather than the black and white, which is possible, but there is a, a funny deep copper color that we get from during a lunar eclipse. Very much like a Maxfield Parish poster for those with an artifact rod. <coughs> it's just sort of otherworldly. Oh, that. Oh, whoop, ah. Why do you jump to? This is Saturn, and this is Regulus. We need a next pattern that time. And of course, another good thing about lunar eclipses is you don't have to travel to bizarre places to actually see them. Now, the next step up is to get one of these things, a tripod. What is the purpose of the tripod? It is steady. I mean, assuming that, you know, there's a garbage truck going right by the sidewalk, 
or that you're not walking on a deck that is very springy in its, in its boards. If you set it up with a tripod and just put it to bulb, which means I will stay open until you tell me to shut up, you get nice effect. Uh, this is, of course, going around Polaris. I always feel it looks a bit like a whirlpool drawing you in. My cousin liked it. I think he saw the puppy in the shop. He's taking his backyard. Bless you. Bless you too. Yes, this is not as bright as I had hoped it would be. There, see that little fuzzy blob? Here's the familiar outline of Perseus. There's Albal. This was Thomas Holmes. A few years back, you remember it was bright enough you could see it literally at college in Sedina looking up. I accosted several people and forced them to look up. <laughs> but just putting it on, uh, just taking the picture for 25 seconds on the tripod, and lo and behold, you've got a picture of the comet. You don't need five hours. <laughs> this is the next step up. The iOptron tracker is a funny little device. The only way you can really make it work is to buy the optional ball head, which just allows you to tilt the camera at unusual angles. You also need a tripod, and of course that's hardly ever included. Your best bet is to get them used, or sometimes Ontario Telescope has them on sale. We, we've got one of these, don't we, in the RASC loaning program? Yes, so just make sure the person that sets up your loan from the RASC program and take it up to the cottage shows you how to set it up. And the most important thing, if you don't have a smartphone, see there's an app. You push the button on your smartphone, it gives you this little double circle, which is what you see when you're looking through the polar scope. And it tells you exactly where Polaris should be. Exactly where Polaris should be, sort of going around the circle at that particular time. Now, I don't have a smartphone. Uh, <laughs> but if you don't have one, you can just Google it on the web and you will get a picture that shows you exactly where your Polaris should be at different times, Eastern Daylight Time. Print it out and put it in the little pouch that comes with this sort of golf club case that the whole thing sits in. And that way, you don't have to ask the track again students from Trent University who are also on the bus to search their Google phones in order to get you the required information. Can we get that here? The IELTS to is no, are we in focus? It seems a bit blurry. <coughs> Yeah, it's, it's all right, Patrick. Yeah. If you expose for about two minutes with an eye out on a tracker, you begin to pick up the brighter star clusters. Can anyone recognize this constellation? Yep. Here we go. Yes. And there is the little triangle. And I think that one's epsilon. This that one. That was the one that was going through the dark, mysterious cloud a few years ago. It does it about every 33 years. Every time we try and find out more about the dark, mysterious cloud. But you can see that you get enough to pick up interesting things. Also, at only two minutes, okay, I confess, I did go through Zoom browser and I push the contrast up. That just makes it look less gray in the background. This is supposed to double cluster of Perseus, and there's a Perseus. 
And all we need is the camera and the iron tractor in a few minutes of your time. Now, you won't get a shooting star every few minutes in that part of the sky. But if you stick with one part of the sky and take 24, 25 exposures, sooner or later you're bound to get lucky. This is the southern sky. There's the Omega Nebula, there's the Eagle Nebula, that's the Sagittarius star cloud. This was exposed again for about two minutes. The only problem if you're using the tractor thingy is that your trees and other landscape features get a little bit blurred because, of course, it's falling in the sky. So you notice that some of the stars seem to be peeking right through the branches because the branch is like this and the stars sort of going across like that. So it goes on and off. It's also a good idea because, of course, this is from Balcaging, and the only light pollution zone is the city of Petro to the south ish. So you, you might want to boost the uh, contrast when you're manipulating your image. But you get a lot of dark in the eye as well as fun things to look at. In the old days, the orange Celestron 8 had a thing in me that you could send in for that would screw into a little hole and like one half screws into the telescope cylinder and the other half is a standard threaded camera mount thingy. I don't even sure if it's still make those. This goes back to the days of what I think of as real film. But this is what we can pick up. This is, of course, again, the book. Oh. Ah. Sorry. This is Milky Way in the early 90s, about the time that uh, that comet uh, crashed into Jupiter. Jupiter was right in the heart of Sagittarius. There were pinched Perseid meteors. And, of course, you have to wait long enough for one of them to point at Comet J. Yeah. It's all the noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is about 15 minutes at ISO 400. It's a slide that has been transcribed. But you, you certainly pick up the dark wings and the bright bits and all the fun things that there are. How many people have Zoom browser? It, it comes with your Canon camera. There's a little CD thing that you're supposed to put in your computer. Zoom browser is a very simple user friendly how do I manipulate my image type of thing. And the idea is that if you have a good image, you can just zoom in on part of it and say, I want this frame to expand to the whole image. It's called the property for some reason. Well, nothing is hard to do. <laughs> so here is those three star clusters you remember from the Oregon picture. The fellow is way out there somewhere. But you're able to actually get what looks a bit more like one of these fancy astrophotographs, which is looking at a smaller part of the sky. And it's, as long as you focus this way, it should come out. This is the Omega Nebula, which I don't, always looks like a bar to me. It doesn't look like an Omega. It looks nothing like the ones in the National Geographic, the Eagle Nebula. And of course, you have a lot more of the stars going through the trees. But you've demonstrated that you can pick up faint, fuzzy objects and blow them up so it looks like a real extra photograph. And all you had was your camera and the tracking device. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
since we do have one available for borrowing, uh, I, again, I'd recommend getting a, a brief uh, tutorial on it just to make sure you're not tracking on the wrong point of the side, which everything will be blurry. There's a tutorial but, on the website when they borrow this, the um, Star Adventure is what we have. Okay, so that's what right I smell. On the so, get out there. I mean, not here in the city, of course. It's fine to get outside the city. It's one of our many dark sky observing sites, trademark. And uh, if you can't drive there yourself because you don't drive, uh, I'm sure some of the friendly members of the RIC are only too glad to split the cost of gasoline and get out there. It's long suit. Do we still go to Camp Robin? No. No, it's no, a long time ago. Yes, well, obviously. <laughs> I think this is the point where I ask for questions. I'm going to drift back this way if the camera wants to track me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions. And uh, Patrick, if you could repeat the questions so that people in yes. can hear us. I seem to have stunned them. Sure. <laughs> Any questions? Going once. Going twice, so I have a Ah, I see. I've got two lenses. There's the basic one that comes with the camera. And there's the other one that is about 85 to 200. It's not one of those huge lenses that you see in the camera shop window where they guy when he's taking it down to show you it has to bend all the visibly or two of them carry it together. No, it, it's quite simple to hold. It gives you a size of sky about oh, 10 full moons across by 8 full moons across. It's not an expensive one. Quite often at downtown camera on their used equipment shelf, they'll have one. You, no, that's the whole point of the presentation. You don't need the fancy stuff, really, <coughs> except maybe for the track. Uh, yes? Have you ever had an interest in photographing the space station or having you plus something so? Well, <clears throat> uh, if you mean as a bright, brilliant street going through that little triangle of stars in Oregon's upper shoulder there, Yes, yes. Uh, if you open it to sort of minimum magnification wide sky, you will get a sort of a not so bright getting brighter, really, really, really bright, 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 getting fainter, 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 type image of the space station. I know some people in the society have uh, used uh, video cameras and they get these great shots of the space station going across the face of the sun. And they take each video frame and then they make this one montage. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten space stations going across the sun. That's, of course, through a white solar filter. Don't just point it at the sun. <laughs> not, not a good idea. And also the moon, I think there's even a website that tells you, uh, if you give them your location, it will tell you if the space station is going to pass in front of the sun or the moon in the next you know, couple of months. You missed it a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I have been teaching full time for the past three weeks, and there are about another week and a half to go. And that's why I'm going to be slipping out at the end of this presentation because I have a stack of three nine incorrigible science exam papers this time <laughs> and two grade 11 physics projects left to go before the other two levels of physics exams come in on Fridays. So if there are no further questions, I hope you all have an opportunity to get out your reasonable dark side and see what that camera of yours can do. Thank you.